So I think let's start our session and begin with the situation in Egypt from a political economy as well as from an uh, ac uh, activist point of view. Okay. okay. It's a good chance for me um, to reflect. I was here in March 2011, as I said, be before uh, the very first referendum that we had in Egypt. I remember being on the phone right here because we were trying to organize flyers, we were campaigning for no vote. Uh, that we lost. And that was the beginning of many losses to come on the way. Uh, however, uh, I was giving this interview today and the journalist somehow thought I was a little bit off or idiotic. He's like, where is the, where is the optimism uh, coming from? Uh, I am uh, optimistic. <coughs> And I think that the euphoria that started uh, in 2011, uh, everyone you know, looking at Egypt and perfect, thank you. Uh, looking at, at Egypt and thinking, oh my God, they're changing history and whatnot. I think um, this was um, an overestimation of a very rough path. Um, but many Egyptians and non-Egyptians, uh, inside and outside the country, thought that those 18 days that we count in the square are the revolution. Uh, and accordingly, when um, things uh, got complicated, this gave away to a lot of despair. That unfortunately gave away to analysis that's bringing back new Orientalist visions about the Arab culture not being fit for democracy, about our liking um, of authoritarianism of different forms, that it's either the Islamists, um, the jihadists, or uh, military dictatorship, uh, so on and so forth. And I think um, a correct way of understanding what's going on is to start uh, from seeing this as an ongoing process. Revolutions, not in Egypt and not anywhere else in the world, historically, they do not happen in 18 days. Uh, sometimes they don't even happen in 18 years. So for starters, taking snapshots of a particular moment, whether it's you know camping in the square or losing an election or having uh, a coup, is, um, lends itself to wrong conclusions. Whereas the idea of an ongoing process understanding the complexity, I think, um, allows us to understand the picture for what it is. Uh, in addition to that, I think we need to move away from looking at Egyptian politics um, and Arab politics at large in terms of binaries, in terms of dichotomies. It's uh, the Islamists versus um, the seculars. It's the Islamists versus the military. Um, Egyptians are 90 million. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, at the largest estimate, uh, have a membership and supporters of uh, around 700,000, less than 1 million. Uh, the military is less than half a million. Um, and there is more than 80 plus million Egyptians who don't necessarily identify with either. They can vote uh, either um, project in power depending on the circumstances and the alternatives available. But there is nothing uh, genetically inherent about us as Arabs or about our culture that would make us go to you know, um, different authoritarian poles, whether they're uh, military uh, or uh, Islamists. Um, we're, we're undergoing a very complex process, and I'm glad that the the title of the lecture is not about the Arab Spring. I think uh, this idea of uh, seasons is very misleading. If we see what's going on as revolts, as revolutions, we will understand that those are historical transformations. It's not a political transition. It's not about when people went out to the streets five years ago, they were chanting, as Magda was saying, they weren't calling for democracy per se. Democracy is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the cherry on the top of the cake. It's a political system that would allow people to vote in and out of office, uh, decision makers that would be responsive and can bring about 
social justice, dignity, and all those things that people are asking for. And hence, uh, judging the outcome by uh, the electoral process uh, that we have or the electoral outcome tends to dismiss the fact that this society is going through huge transformations. It's questioning things that it hasn't questioned in the past 60 years. It's questioning things about um, religion. It's questioning and changing gender uh, relations. It's questioning things about the patriarchal uh, authority in the family. And those things do not uh, settle down in five years, uh, which is the time that we have been um, undergoing. Uh, currently, um, we have a military dictatorship in power. It's much worse. I've been an activist. Helmut was kind to me and wanted to make me seem younger, but I've been politically active and engaged in politics in my country for over 20 years. And I haven't seen a worse situation at no point. Not in the 90s when we had terrorism and the jihadis, um, not under SCAF, the after 2011, the, the military council, not under uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, President Mohammed Morsi. Uh, we are experiencing a phenomenon that we haven't known in Egypt, disappearances, uh, people being abducted and not knowing where they are, um, uh, massive torture, people being deprived, prisoners being deprived of uh, food and medication until death, and this is literal, it's not um, figurative. Um, but this is not sustainable. By all stretches of imagination, it's not sustainable. And it's not sustainable not because I'm wishful, but it's not sustainable for uh, very material um, reasons. So let me take you quickly through those, uh, through those uh, reasons, and then uh, I'll tell you what I think is bound to happen in the future. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the CC regime is facing uh, the simul simultaneously the problem of growth and distribution. Unlike countries of the Asian Tigers, for example, who had uh, a developmental moment in the 70s um, where the global economy um, was very flourishing and where they could actually establish high levels of growth and hence uh, at a later stage attempt to issues of distribution. Egypt has to face um, popular demands of 90 million about distribution of wealth that's very uh, much concentrated at a point where the global economic system is undergoing a crisis. A crisis that manifests itself in different ways from um, the debt crisis and the finance crisis in the US, the Occupy, Wall Street and whatnot, to the Greek uh, crisis in Europe. Uh, we are to the, uh, even China reaching uh, the limits of uh, its growth as we, as we know now. So globally, it's not a conducive moment for uh, high rates of economic growth. This is further compounded by the fact that the CC regime does not have an economic vision. Uh, this is manifesting itself in, um, in different ways. Uh, when he first came to power, for example, he wanted to create a big economic and uh, political propaganda splash. So he came up with, uh, he didn't come up with, but he, he decided to take up the project of digging a branch for the Suez um, Canal. And instead of doing this in three years, he decided to do it uh, in one year. You know, he's, he tends to portray himself as this macho dude old Superman. Um, what well this, uh, yeah, the, the guy is serious, he has issues, but that's, that's, the, that's besides the point of this, I, yeah, yeah, that, I hope a uh, psych psychologist in the room can take, um, can take this up. Uh, <clears throat> to do this in one year instead of three years, uh, what he did is deplete 
uh, the Egyptian foreign reserves. He had to buy tractors, to take, he had to uh, hire a lot of um, subcontractors, and all this is being paid in dollars. So, a year after the after finishing the the this stream, this canal, uh, what we have what we saw is that the exchange rate of the Egyptian pound uh, plunged down uh, to more than uh, twenty percent. Um, but this is all, only one example of the lack uh, of vision. He, because he's trying to create political propaganda, he's trying to focus on a uh, mega project uh, of the 60s style. So trying to build a new um, capital, uh, another new Cairo, uh, holding a big international conference in Sharm el-Sheikh um, last March, so on and so forth. Uh, but without focusing on what resources we have, what kind of smaller projects would uh, lead to, hi to higher levels of employment, so on um, and so forth. That's in addition to many examples of, I don't want to bore you with the details of the kind of laws that he has been issuing, uh, slashing taxes on investors, um, uh, privatizing uh, the 30 remaining uh, public holding companies that are actually profitable, so on and so forth. Um, added to this is the fact that the rents that, you, that were coming from the Gulf and that were floating the Egyptian economy for a while, especially right after the coup in 2013, have stopped. Have stopped because the Gulf itself has to finance many wars in Yemen and in Syria, uh, but also has stopped because um, they're seeing that this is, they're giving this to a very inefficient administration. There is no uh, outcome of the money that they're paying. Uh, this leads us to the final thing um, that, com that com further complicates the issue of growth of the and distribution which is the failed bureaucracy. This, is n this has nothing to do with the current regime per se. But this is a problem that Mubarak did not know how to deal with. He tried to create a parallel uh, bureaucracy to leave this boat as is, and to hire you know, the new yuppies, give them uh, more money, and have technical offices in each ministry running it. And of course, they failed miserably. Um, now, CC, for example, um, issued a law uh, by which it's, it's the civil service law uh, by which uh, he wants to slash down in his last speech. Uh, four days ago, he said that Egypt has uh, seven million uh, civil servants, employees, and it only needs one. Of course, that's absolute BS, you know, what? Um, because the, the global, I mean, the percentage um, of state employees that Egypt has in comparison to the population is less than anything that Britain has or Austria, for example, uh, so on and so forth. But of course, that's what he thinks is the, is the solution. It's a, the parliament actually voted no. That was the only law uh, out of more than 500 laws issued by Sisi and his uh, predecessor, that the, 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 the parliament voted no. And now we're at a standstill. So even if rents are back, even if money is being poured in the country, the fact that you do not have a functioning bureaucracy and you lack an economic vision would not allow this regime to attend to the demands of the people having to do with growth and distribution. That part of social justice that they were out for, the bread, the jobs, the, the schools, the hospitals, so on and so forth. Um, the other problem, the second big issue that makes uh, the CC regime um, unsustainable is the changing social contract and the lack of allies. All of his prede predecessors had an, um, a core group in society that provided support for the regime. 
Uh, so Northfield, for example, capitalized the social contract was about social mobility. People give up their uh, political rights, but in uh, return, they get uh, free education, good education, good jobs, uh, so on and so forth. So they get the economic rights, and that was the social contract. Um, so that continued with this, but uh, integrated the economic opening, so businessmen. And then Mubarak tried to balance all, um, all those factions and included uh, yuppies and young businessmen that came with his um, son, <clears throat> and he failed uh, miserably. Sisi, unfortunately, wants, because he's a uh, political maverick because he's a populist and thinks that he's more intelligent than everyone else, he thinks that he can balance uh, contrasts and odds. So uh, he portrays himself partly as Nasser, you know, state capitalism, we need to have a big economy, hence the Suez Canal thing, hence the, <clears throat> the new um, capital, so on and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, slashes um, uh, taxes, um, forces uh, big businesses to pay in a fund that he created and that is uh, supervised by him called Tahya Masr, a long live Egypt fund. So instead of them paying taxes, he calls businessmen up and he's like, you, you pay X amount, you, don't, you never know what what's this X amount, or um, the land that you took in the desert for the, will be confiscated. Um, just a quick example about how um, the, the contradiction and, and, and lack of allies. Back in November, the second week of November, uh, of last, just two, uh, two months ago, in the same week, uh, CC regime uh, detained one of the top businessmen, uh, Salah Diab, he's a big conglomerate, he owns a newspaper, um, owns the biggest uh, agricultural company, uh, real estate development, anything and everything, and at the same time detained a human rights activist, Hossein Bak. Both of which created a huge uproar. The kind of statement that um, when, I, when I read the statement issued by the Egyptian businessman chamber, I wasn't sure whether it was a you know, Trotsky, you know, communist uh, group, or actually the businessman chamber. It was so, um, so harsh on the regime. Uh, but also, Ban Ki-moon and other human rights organizations issued equally uh, aggressive statements in solidarity with Hossein Baga, the human rights activist. To top it all, um, both uh, the two men were sentenced uh, one for, two, for uh, four years in prison, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, four days under detention and one 15 days. And CC, or the, who speaks about you know, the, the judiciary and how independent it is, ordered them, because of the pressure, ordered them release, be released before they completed uh, those amount. So, in one hit, he managed to offend uh, the businessman community, the activist and human rights international uh, community, and the judiciary to an extent. Um, <clears throat> Also politically, uh, the, the current regime has moved from a selective, uh, you're, you're keeping it on, on this one. Okay. Um, moved from the use of selective coercion and repression, which both his three predecessors have used, you know, um, setting examples, targeting people because they represent some kind of threat, to using blanket coercion. So anyone and everyone, uh, from activists to two days ago, one of my students at the American University in Cairo, who is Italian, um, doesn't work on anything, you know, um, uh, having to do with dissent or opposition, disappeared. 
and he is still missing until now. This is among a long list of disappearances ha uh, happening uh, in Egypt. Uh, not all of them are politically involved. Um, but because the system is not as in control as it was under the Mubarak regime, and because it's coming as part of a counter-revolution, with the very vivid memory of people taking uh, back, taking to the streets and toppling a regime, it's just using repression and coercion blindly. And as I said, it's blanket coercion. This comes at a cost, because any regime, no matter how, <coughs> how totalitarian, uh, let alone authoritarian it is, has to balance coercion and cooptation. And the, the current regime in Egypt is failing on both fronts. It doesn't have the economic means to provide for cooptation. It doesn't have the political uh, vision to appease certain allies. <clears throat> and it's using a coercion at a very uh, high cost. Add to this the rivalry happening between the different security apparatuses. The, the Mubarak regime, at least for the last 10 years of its, um, of its uh, uh, life, was held together by a very strong part of the Ministry of Interior, which is the state security apparatus, Amnidab. Now what we see uh, in Egypt is a rivalry between at least, those are the ones we know, at least four security apparatuses. The, uh, the state security, which is now uh, goes by the nickname national security, uh, the military intelligence, the general intelligence, and uh, the pre presidential security. All being involved in uh, all the cases. This kind of rivalry is being replicated in every part of the Egyptian administration and the Egyptian state. When you don't have a democratic process that can channel those kinds of political rivalries and rivalries over turf, uh, you as a, a regime is in a big uh, mess because no one is in control. When someone goes missing, you have to go. There isn't a single uh, authority that you can uh, go talk to and be assured whether that person is arrested or not. No one knows. <clears throat> I want to go to the final thing, and then okay. I will stop. Fine. Yes, Fine. I, I mean, you didn't tell me that five, five minutes left. Five minutes. Okay. Um, the final thing that's making it difficult um, and uh, for this regime to continue is the regional uh, element. We are part, we are at the heart of a brewing region. Uh, this is not just because of uh, civil wars and violence that we see in Syria and Iraq and Libya, but also because the, the axes of alliances in the region are changing by the day. Um, Iran is now back as a major uh, player, and especially with the recent um, rapprochement um, with the US um, and whatnot. Um, the Saudi Arabia thinks that it is actually the leader, that it, that it should be playing the role that Egypt used to play um, back in the 60s, and though those two are polar opposites to an extent, add to this Turkey, add to this aspiring Qatar. This is a map that's not only uh, being constantly um, pushed to implosion by violence, but also by aspirations of many um, actors and many theaters um, of action. Um, and Egypt is not far away. And if someone does not have that uh, you know, political vision to build allies inside, you can imagine how completely confused the Egyptian <coughs> foreign policy is. Most of our uh, embassies abroad I hope that there's someone from the Egyptian embassy here. Um, most of our embassies abroad are now actually, what they're focusing is attending on, is attending talks like this and reporting activists and speakers to the national security back home. 
uh, they're not part of trying to put together uh, any kind of a strategic vision at this time of global and, uh, and regional change. Where does this take us um, from here? And why do I, after saying all this, do I remain optimistic? I remain optimistic, one, because this regime is not sustainable. And as much as we uh, burst the bubble of political Islam, at least in Egypt, we are bursting the bubble of uh, military dictatorship being uh, a good mode of government in the post-colonial uh, state that we are. Um, I'm optimistic because the kind of resistance that we're seeing day to day, uh, which has nothing to do uh, with occupying squares, but it's ongoing. During uh, the past year, 2015, there was more than 1,200 socioeconomic protests by workers and employees. This means that on average, three uh, protests a day by regular Egyptians who are protesting job conditions uh, and whatnot. Um, over the, uh, just two days ago on the 25th, uh, a couple of uh, uh, young Egyptian uh, men uh, had a video um, in which they blew condoms and gave them out in Tahrir uh, Square to policemen. Uh, and as much as this caused you know, uh, hysteria for the regime and its supporters, but in less than 48 hours, uh, the video had more than 1.5 million viewers, and Chedi, one of the two guys who made the video, was telling me yesterday that he received more than half a million uh, shares and letters in his inbox. He's just, it's, it's imploding with letters of support. This kind of, of resistance does not die out. The genie is out of the bottle. It was it manifested itself five years ago in the square, but it's manifesting itself daily in small actions of resistance that will culminate in um, inevitable uh, change. Thank you very much.